You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. Just out of The Apprentice, so, you know, 12 million views, blah, blah, blah. And here she is, the bitch you always thought, shagging someone else's husband. So I got toughened up by um, my father and a very strict way of life. I was never, it was nothing ever, I don't want anyone to get the wrong impression about how I see my dad, uh, because my dad's done very good by me all my life. And when my life went wrong, my husband ran off with a secretary. I'm, I was massively epileptic, so I had massive seizures, and I had to, and my arms would dislocate, I had to pull myself together overnight, get it back together, get my face on, and get back to work. That toughened me up, um, and the military toughened me up. I honestly looked into, and I had roots to, uh, getting a hitman to take out my husband, not, not a joke. Um, I had a good bunch of contacts in the Marines. We are facing darkness. We're going to be pushed and squeezed. We're going to be forced out of our private vehicles. We're going to be forced out of our homes. We're going to have every freedom we ever knew in our lives taken. And that's coming right now. When did people find out you're going I for that operation? I can still feel my vagina. That's the main thing, do you know what I mean? <laughs> what I mean? As long as you can feel the grass in your ass when you're shagging in, when you're shagging in a field, it's all good, it's worth it. I, I found the assassination of Katie Hopkins, the play that the government funded, part funded, and the posters going up, and my mother was particularly upset by those. I found that difficult. That's a brave thing to do, though. Why not? Ah, <sighs> set me off any day of the week. Boom, we're on. <laughs> and today's case, we've got Katie Hopkins. Katie, how are you? I'm really well, thank you. I'm really well. You're looking well. Yeah, I'm You're doing glowing. really... Oh, bless you. Well, that might be the additional highlighter. But yeah, I'm really well. Probably the best mm -hmm. uh, in terms of health like I've ever been. So it's good. 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 Yeah, it's nice. I know you've been very controversial over the years. Like you've never held back. The one thing I like about you, Katie, is you've never bent over. You've never played the victim. You've never says even all the trolls, all the bullshit. You've still stood at the forefront, if you believe it, you says it. And people have obviously had their opinion. This is a society we're in now. But first and foremost, thanks for coming on the show. Oh, it's totally my pleasure. I just went over the road to uh, hang out. I was going to ring you so I was here. And they're like, oh, you're here for James, aren't you? And I was like, yes, I am. Mm -hmm. So, uh, no, it's absolutely my pleasure. And actually, um, the reason, I guess, that I'm here is that a lot of people said, you should be on with James, you should be on with James. And that's why I guess you and I found each other in the end, mm -hmm. is that a lot of my kind of supporters or, or anybody that listens to me were like, you should be on with James. Lucky you. I know, yeah. thanks to them for this. Yeah. Before we get into everything though, I always like to go back to the start of my guests, get a bit of understanding about them, where you grew up and how it all began. <laughs> well, nothing. Normal, normal, normal. <laughs> vanilla, vanilla. A convent school taught by nuns. I mean, whoever thought that was a great idea, right? Oh, yeah. you're religious. You can teach. And um, as just a really normal kid with stay-at-home mom, dad, electrical engineer, uh, go to school, come home, uh, take your school uniform off because you had to look after the uniform because it was expensive. Uh, tea on the table at five o'clock. No messing. What dad said went. Uh, no one argued with dad. And if you did, you got that it was a backhand dad could do. So you would whiz up the stairs, like fly up the stairs. If you made it past about floor, about stair four, you would probably avoid dad's backhand. So my upbringing was super standard, super normal, straight to university and then university to the army and straight through Sandhurst. So everything was really a straight line up until a certain point. Was your dad in the army? No, Just a very not strict at all. father? Strict, um, uh, council house, lots of brothers, tiny property, father died, boys, you know, looking after themselves. So, so order, and discipline, and this is the rule and no one argues and you'll sit there till your tea's eaten. You know, stuff yeah. we, a lot of mm -hmm. us knew, right? That was definitely my upbringing. Did you think that affects you as well as a kid? I, I just, there was a lot of rules. There was a lot of rules a lot of the time. And I guess there's always been, I've always had something a bit naughty that's just rebel, like, so I would rebel, I think when I was young, just by doing things pretty easily like I got all A's and whatever I got 
I'm not trying to be like, oh, I did this. But like I, I did grade eight violin, grade eight piano by the time I was 14. Like I, I would win sports day, whatever. I, what I'm trying to say is I kind of rebelled by just showing that it was kind of easy, which was annoying for a lot of people, I think. Uh, but there were, even with the nuns, like rule crazy. I, I'm left-handed. The nuns, even in my era, and I'm not 65 that people think I am. I'm actually only 47. And they used to tie my left hand behind my back because it's not godly to write with your left hand. So I guess the point is there was a lot of rules. And then I went into the army in Sandhurst where there's even more rules. But there's always been this kind of maverick me inside that's like, yeah, sure, I'll take your rule and I'll beat what you've told me I have to do. And I'll prove to you it was easy. And, th and that's kind of my mindset, I guess. Yeah. What about university? Yeah, I found it boring, you know, it was mm. three years. Who needs to be anywhere for three years? What did you do? Oh, God, economics. <laughs> at the University of Exeter, which back in the day was supposed to be like one of the top five. Role. And uh, just dullards and, and people, you know, you're just like, how are you staying here for three years? After year two, I was completely done. I'd already been away in Australia for a year, uh, sort of gallivanting. And I... Uh, I just found it, I just found it so constraining, but I just needed that bit of paper. So I stuck mm -hmm. it and the army were paying for me to be there. But um, yeah, university, I'm not a believer in at all. And my kids now have got 18, 17, 14. None of them at present want to go to university. And that is probably one of my biggest achievements to date is that none of my kids want to go. And currently one of them, well, one of them moved out last week to be a farm hand on a farm and is living in a caravan on a farm. So I'm kind of proud of that mm -hmm. it's mad that you, you'd have probably thought your kids might have went down your route yeah just well, the kind of straight line straight yes. university kind of ingrained but do you think you'd have enjoyed the army if it wasn't so regimented yeah i would because it was looking hard for guidance no nah, i was looking for hard so i had a boyfriend and he was a big tall strapping lad and uh, he got into sandhurst and this is classic me he's a lot older than me and he's and i was like well if that twat can get into sandhurst I can bloody get into Sandhurst. And then some people told me that I probably couldn't or probably wouldn't. And I was like, mm, I'll be getting into Sandhurst then. And that's what happens. Uh, and there's this weird, I don't know what that's about, but this this idea of, right, okay, watch this. So, uh, so, but now like in our, or my generation, I can't include you and me, can I? Cause you're I'm younger than me. How old are you? 39. You're just a little baby. Thank you. You're so Thank you. You are really cute, aren't I you? I guess. Yeah. That's how I get away with half the shit I, I say. I can see your little face. You're like, you've got a, I can see you could dial in your face and your teeth so that if you're in the, if you're in the shit, you can just pull a James yeah. and you can overwhelm someone with cheekiness. Cheeky and I can chap, see that. And it's that? very, very yeah. good. It's very effective mm -hmm. already on me. Thank uh, you. Yeah, no problem. So most people... We're like, well, this was, she was the first kid in our family to go to university. It became like a thing right back in the day. Mm -hmm. And now I'm like, my kids don't want to go to uni. And I say it a lot because it pisses, you can see the other parents' faces. They're like, but we're so proud of Matilda because she's going off to study psychology at somewhere. And I think, oh, piss off. Yeah. You were know? you very outspoken back then? Are we always on the fence? No, keep, no, not on the fence. Just keeping it in, you know, keeping it in, channeling it a bit more, I think, mm -hmm. like, just channel it into being the best at this or I can do that or I'll beat you at that or I'll be the fastest at this. That's what I did, the 800 metres for the army and was the fastest. So it was just a bit more channeled back then in a more disciplined way, <laughs> probably for the best. Yeah, do you think that was just a case of bottling everything up, being conditioned, being smacked as a kid as well, that just fueled with something and then there's a button where you just open the floodgates and, and think, fuck this. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, and I don't... You know, let's let's be clear. I don't mind that I was smacked as a kid at all. I totally risk. I wouldn't. That wouldn't be my choice for my kids now. Um, I would flinch if I saw someone else doing it to a kid. But back in the day, uh, I totally respect what Dad did for all of us, which was work really, really hard so that we got to do lots of stuff, and he provided for the family in the old school way. So I got no complaints about the way I was brought up. But there was a lot of rules in my life and it was all getting ready to blow. And I think and I think that reflects in later life when we get to kind of where we're at now, now that they're kind of pushed these rules on people, it's that same feeling I get, which mm -hmm. is come on then watch me. No, I won't. Yeah. You know that. It's that same thing. So you've been that very outspoken character, but do you think those slaps from your dad fucking toughened you up as yeah. well that I made got, you who you are? Got toughened up a lot along the way. So I got toughened up by um, 
my father and a very strict way of life. I was never, it was nothing ever, I don't want anyone to get the wrong impression about how I see my dad, because uh, my dad's done very good by me all my life. And when my life went wrong, my husband ran off with a secretary. She was pretty good looking. Uh, my father stepped in. Shaga. And uh, my father filled that role. So, you know, full kudos to my dad. That toughened me up. Uh, I'm, I was massively epileptic, so I had massive seizures. And I had to, and my arms would dislocate. I had to pull myself together overnight, get it back together, get my face on and get back to work. That toughened me up. Um, and the military toughened me up. Being shouted at by big guys in your face in a personal way is brilliant for setting you up for life. You know, Hopkins, you could eat. I remember him, this big Academy Sergeant Major RSM shouting in Welsh across the parade square, you know, you could eat an apple for a tennis racket with those teeth. You know, the old lines, but they're bloody funny, mm -hmm. but shouted at you. So I got schooled in taking a lot of face level criticism. Yeah, at a young age. See so how you like people shouting at you? Was your relationships the same? Because you can be quite overpowering. Like yeah. You're very quite, you're, you're, you're very witty and you're quite intelligent. Where did you, ex, did you look for that in relationships as well? Or were you the overpowering one? Yeah, I, so that my first marriage was entirely that. So I met someone who was basically me, but older and male. You like the older men? <laughs> at that time. Uh, well, just, just, it wasn't about any of that. It was about that he would walk in a room and the room would know he walked in. And it was really attractive to me. And it was kind of my other, it was like marrying me, I guess, in a different way. And uh, went to America, lived in America for five years with this guy. So, but that was problematic because we're the same thing. And I am way overpowering. I'm way too bossy. And that marriage, when we got married, lasted less than a year. <laughs> <laughs> my friends were like give it a year and I was like mm, eight months bitches so I uh, uh, he left he ran away with and I worked in the company he ran away with the secretary and I had two kids we had two children under the age of one and a half just about I know I got straight back yeah. on the horse was that the guy you were shagging in the field oh no that's this guy the new one? That's my husband now. Oh, good. The one that's what's lasted? <laughs> 13 years. Uh, so it just goes to show, you know, if anybody out there has got problems with their marriage or their relationships, if you just have sex in the field, it works. Keep it natural, isn't it? I know, man. Do you know what I mean? Like, that was a that was a cheese days now. It's the wildest day. Because <laughs> the, the rumour, so, so the speculation, and I would allege it as well, knowing what I know about the press, is that that was set up. But the truth was, we were just at it. And we'd driven off from the station where he'd, I think, come and got me. And we were just finding a place to do that because he was still at home with his wife. But the way it was set up with the gate, and also we both looked kind of hot, made it seem really staged. But I was kind of proud of the fact that that wasn't staged. Although, at the time I was working for the public sector, the weather people, the Met Office, the people that do the weather, and I had to ring my boss... And I had, I had a very highly paid job and tell him I was going to be on the front page of the people in the morning straddling Mark. <laughs> that <laughs> is not a conversation. And this was still back in the time of Sensible uh -huh. Me. You know, that isn't in this setting. This was back in the straight laced Hopkins. I had to ring my boss and tell him I was naked on the front pages tomorrow. <laughs> is that when the shackles came off do you think when you just started going oh fuck it oh my god do you still laugh about that you and your husband oh, we don't talk about it actually because it's just part of what we were about it's you not know. even a big thing somebody it shagging a, in the field I know it wasn't a big thing but it was it was a much bigger thing and I'm not like oh but my bra it's different for women if it had been a bloke it'd probably hardly been a story but because it was sort of strong woman just out of the it was just out of the apprentice so mm. you know 12 million views blah 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 and here she is the bitch you always thought shagging someone else's husband in a field i mean it was perfect <laughs> like you, if you couldn't write it but i i think that um you know i do think it's part of what M M mark and i are about is about being free but what really what really i guess opened the can was in fact my husband my first husband damien leaving and leaving me and and it was as if uh all the rules i thought were rules didn't matter anymore because i i was now me with two children under the age of one and a half 
on my own. And I also worked for the guy. So I, I now had no job either. And for the first time in my life, I was like, I am alone. I don't have a job. I don't have a father. I don't have a husband. My life, my straight line life that has been by the book, super performing, outperforming, one in four, one in three, came first in, wait a minute, I am now a single mother without a husband, a house and a mortgage and no job. And I was, I got a good smack in the face, courtesy of my first marriage. Mm. Um, and a lot of that was because I was a pain in the ass. So, you know, there's no, oh, he's the bad guy. Uh, not at all. I don't look, I don't have any feelings like that at all. Actually, I look at it as that was probably meant to happen, but it led to me applying to be on The Apprentice. And then all of the tools and the techniques and the nonsense and the naughtiness and the everything I'd been keeping in for 28 years just came out. And I didn't even know I was doing it. How did you handle that rejection? Being overpowering women, being probably quite controlling. Oi, being but, left. Yeah. I mean, there's some things I've not talked of ever, but like I had just, so I was left. I, yeah, I've packaged this away fairly successfully. So I had Indy, my eldest, and she's one and a half. Then I have Poppy straight off the bat. And um, I was left in the maternity ward with Poppy and he left and he never, so I had the baby. He was sort of there, although he was chatting up the nurses. And uh, then he left the next morning and I woke up in the maternity unit with Poppy and I had to get a taxi home. So I had a one and a half year old, a one day old, and he'd gone to go and, and I knew he was with the lady he'd left with. And that, that, that was so brutal. And honestly, uh, without a word of a lie, once I started working through the things you have to deal with when that sort of thing happens, so you have to separate stuff, the divorce papers come through, you have to start working out what you're going to sell, what you're going to, you have to work through shit. I honestly looked into, and I had roots to uh, getting a hitman to take out my husband, not, not a joke. Um, I had a good bunch of contacts in the Marines and uh, because it felt much more, it felt much more practical as a solution than going through the rigmarole. And I felt for my daughters that when they grew up, it would be much more mm, reassuring for them, for me to say your father got killed in a whatever car accident, than it would to say, well, your dad left you. And I've never once ever said that to my girls, nor will I. And I've never once uh, not held the line that things didn't work out and, and here I am and this has worked out great and isn't your life great and what should we do later? And mm -hmm. I've never once gone back and criticised or talked of this with them. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's when you then press the fuck it button and go, I'm already broken sort of thing, so I'm just going to own it? I just, I, 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 at the time of, say, applying for The Apprentice, I wanted to shift, like, so, you know, if you're going along a straight line, mm. I wanted to shift 90 degrees. And I didn't even care if it was 180 in a downhill trajectory. Like, it didn't matter. I just needed to shift this thing. And I remember applying. I can remember filling in that application form. And I can remember using all the tools of, of life and things we learn about how do I get in this? How do I talk my way into this? How do I and writing that form to get me on the show. And I knew kind of what they would be looking for. I knew what I had to do. I would be the big ball busting corporate America, woman in the white suit, which I wore all the time, uh, who happens to have two kids as well and is like power balls. And I wrote in, in one of the questions on the application forms, what's the worst thing you've ever done? And it was, I stole someone else's husband. And I went to the interview process, was mad for The Apprentice, but every time you got past an interview table, which was just set up like this, I'd tell them the stuff I knew they wanted to hear, and I'd be sent to the next room, and the next room, and the next room, till I ended up in front of the big panel. And I knew this was the big panel, I knew they would want me on, because I was kind of odd, I was an oddity, 28, you know, alone, kids, powerful, big salary. And the example I gave in my handbag, by by chance, I would needed to get. I don't. You do. Ha, do you have children? Yeah, two. How old are they? Both Not twelve to pry. Um, so you know, maybe you know that shopping for children's shoes. Like if you had a choice of killing yourself 
or shopping for children's shoes, you probably pick killing yourself. <laughs> like that's how I feel. I hate shoe stores. I hate other mothers. I hate other children. So I had drawn around the girl's tiny feet. They were only this big, one, one, and one and a half. And I'd taken the template of drawing around their feet to the shoe shop because I thought, well, I'll just get the shoe that fits the template. I don't have to take kids in. I don't have to deal with children or people and I'll get the shoes. And at the interview, that's what I produced out of my handbag because I thought it was a smart shortcut for an efficient way of mothering and life. And I could see on all of their faces that didn't seem normal to them. And I said, like, oh, okay, then. So I ended up on The Apprentice. And then that's when I was just honest. I was just damn honest. You know, if someone was terrible, I said it. If someone was looked dreadful in their outfits, I said it. If someone was too orange, whatever that orange Irish woman was called, I said it. And I thought everyone else was doing the same. Mm -hmm. And then and then it came to air and it was just me. So you were in the, you, you walked away from that? Yeah. Why? So got to the very end and without wishing to bore everybody with the excruciating detail, essentially... When you filmed The Apprentice back in the day, it was filmed over six weeks and they kept you hostage for six weeks. No phone, no money, no, you're not allowed out. You had a chauffeur, a, a chaperone, sorry, who stood outside the toilet door. I mean, it was oppressively restrictive, but it was filmed six months in advance of when it came out. But the last, the last bit, the final was held. So the idea was if you got to the final, like I got to, you were supposed to go and sit on your ass in Brentwood and wait for TV World to catch up with you, for them to air the final, for them to decide if you got a non-job with Lord Sugar, because there was never really a job anyway, because it was all a load of TV bollocks. And I was like, wait, 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 wait. you want me to go and sit in Brentwood for six months? I've got a life back home. I've got kids. I've got, I've got shit to do. I also had another job that paid more than the bloody apprentice was offering. Like I didn't need them. And so I, I fired Lord Sugar. And in the first take, I did it very, um, I did it my way. But of course that wasn't allowed, it had to be redone. So I had to be a little bit more gracious, a little bit blah, 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 blah. And because of my children, I think I should leave. And then I was allowed to leave. So that's why I walked out really was because of this bizarre, well, A, I wouldn't work for Lord Sugar. B, there wasn't really a job. C, he's short and I don't agree with short men. Sorry, James. And I, um, <laughs> and D, and D, I was never, ever going to sit in Brentwood. Yeah. yeah. So how, how was Lord Sugar as a person? Wouldn't know. Yeah, you wouldn't know. If you go on The Apprentice, you never, ever speak to him. You know, you know, and someone like me or you, we would find a wangling way of having a little five mm. minutes with Lord Sugar, right? But never, ever. So you're set up on your square. You stay on your square. He comes in, films, and off he goes. And even in the boardroom, you don't talk to him. You're not allowed to speak until he speaks to you. And then they wait for him to be fed his line. And then you retake. So if you said something smart... I get my lion fed and we retake. So you never, ever, sp I've never spoken to Lord Sugar personally. That's when your whole life kind of changed though, isn't it? Because Massive. that got mega views and you, yeah. were, you were the most spoken person on that show. That. Yeah. So you came out that. That was the moment it changed. Is yeah. that when you realised, okay, fuck it, I've got something here, I'm going to roll with it? Or did you become, did you change characters or was that the character you had bottled up since you were a kid? Yeah, no, that wasn't a ca character really. I mean, it's just an extension or probably a true version of me. Like I had kind of reined it back. School, uni, uh, get through Sandhurst, do the right thing, corporate America, boardrooms, Ur professional professional but inside was all of this boo and colorful language and laughing and being obnoxiously rude and saying what I thought and not caring that you were shocked or that HR would be angry and to the point where I could lose a job you know and that all came out then and initially I was just slightly terrified because I didn't know media I didn't know what what it meant to be known I didn't know what it would be like to have you know, the newspapers on my lawn, on my parents' lawn, all of that. I ran away and did the jungle and just hid. But I, um, when I came back, that's when I started really channeling this. Here's a topic. What's your thoughts on it? Give them the light. I believe the stuff I've said, but don't flinch from what you've said. That's the bit that's different. It was always, well, you're not me, you necessarily, James, but you're overweight. So I wouldn't employ you because I don't want to work with a fat person. But it was the pause after that was the thing. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't really what I was saying necessarily. It was the fact that I would then hold it. And people found that so 
deeply uncomfortable as a British person. That's what it was. Do you think you were the first woman in the UK to ever do such things and speak out like that? I think so. It was the first time most people had seen anything like that. Or actually, I believe it's much more about that thing I was just saying about the silence. It was the first time they'd ever seen someone own it. So it was the first time they hadn't seen someone that, well, yesterday I was on this morning and I may have overspoken and I may have misspoken and I said this, but what I really meant was this and I'm so sorry. And I refuse to ever do that. If I um, insulted you today or or did something here, I would apologise to you immediately and I would want it to be right between us, whatever that took. But in terms of apologising for something I've said because I don't like not being liked, that's my line that I refuse to do. I will accept not being liked for my views. I will accept a lot of the shit that's gone on in my life. I have made happen. And I accept everything that's been done to me because I made the decision to put myself out there. And I personally believe you have to suck it up. And and I think that about MPs who get death threats. I think that about people like me. You just got to accept if you put yourself out there, it's not all going to be sparkles and glitter and contracts on the BBC. See, when you're totally out there and you've went for it, this is me 100%, that... Was there an enjoyment or when does it become on top where you're that, you're that person now, you can't go back? You see a lot of wet wipes now saying shit, backtracking, saying sorry. Um, and it's just, for me, it's weak. But stand your ground, listen, we all make mistakes. We all go through different stages in life. We all go through different patterns. We do kind of, I wouldn't say mature, but we see the world differently. I had Tommy Robinson on that. I never thought he'd be saying the shit that he's saying now that he did three years ago. Seeing the world differently, fair play to the man that... Like, for anybody that sees the world, that we're all raised differently, but for me, it's to let people say things from their side. Why are you getting so offended about what somebody's got to say? Now, we talk about the transgender stuff and drag queens reading story times. Like, stay away from the fucking nurseries. Stay away from the schools. I express my opinion all the time on this shit, and people go, oh, you're this phobe and that phobe. I'm not. I'm just protecting my kids. Like, keep it 18 plus. If you want to do whatever behind closed doors, fucking do it. Don't feed my kids. They don't need to see that bollocks. And I'm not going to have you tell me... In, to try and normalise that that it's okay because people are so dumbed down they believe and see whatever they believe and see as as gospel to them and that's the scary thing that we can get into lockdown we can get into so much shit that people are so dumbed down and the media has got such a big presence that people believe and people see the world from their views and that's a scary thing i think that and i also think for you know i know that we have uh, a support network out there like this massive family of people who uh, will give us a you know cheer us on in the street or, or shout out their cab window you know go on bird um and we are so many you know we might think we're on our own we're not and this is what i tell people on the road all the time we are so many in number across continents like america australians they're with us and we're with them But I think one of the things that's happened is not that people are necessarily uh, sheep and stupid, though that's a proportion and we know who they are and they pushed the vax and they isolated their family members and all the rest. But people are schooled into learning what happens to someone who stands up. So what happens to someone who puts their head above the parapet and continues. So you get employed by Daily Mail, you get employed by LBC, like mainstream stuff, and then you continue to speak truth watch what we're going to do to her, watch what we do to Tommy, watch what we do to this guy, Belfield, whatever. And it's like a lesson to other people. Don't, don't, you don't want to be like them. You don't want to lose your home. You don't want to lose your jobs. You don't want to lose your family. You don't want to, what what happened to her? You don't want that to happen to you. And it's a way of controlling the general public is, or controlling opinion is to say, well, you just keep quiet over there or we'll come for you. And and I think that's how we've been used or I've been used as well. So see, when you started off at that, was it cool, exciting, something fresh, somebody who's straight down the middle, somebody who's in the army, you end up working for the Met, you're making a good wage. Obviously, it would have been exciting and fresh and new and kind of as, as if you're living your best life. When did you realise how toxic it was yeah. working in these environments? Yeah, that's so, that's so a thing is that there was there was an initial coming out of the apprentice and I genuinely I genuinely thought I'll come out somewhere near the middle and people will say oh she was a good egg she was funny and and she's pretty smart and uh you know good as gold out I go 
And of course, stay to the end, it became a big thing, biggest bitch in Britain. Then I get caught humping my husband in the field, someone else's husband at the time. But nothing to see here. But I, um, there was a, so there was the point where it was this morning and then I had my Daily Mail column and I loved it. And my LBC show, like radio to me is the great, the thing I miss most of all, if I could have one thing back, just one thing would be my LBC show because I bloody loved that show because people would ring me in their pajamas from their kitchens on a Sunday morning and they told the, tr the whole truth into that phone because it was just me they were speaking to. And the nation, whoever was listening, got to hear ordinary people say things they really felt. And that was just the most amazing thing I ever got to do. But I realised after a, a, a year or so, I think it took me a good year or so to realise just how brutal, how toxic, how contrived, how manipulated it was. And that was pressure to not say that, to undo that. A meeting with, um, who should I meet? A Labour leader. And I had to undo that story. It, just odd things happening that didn't make any sense necessarily. Uh, and then being eventually pushed out of Mail Online by this dark network that descended of, of heads of, so the chief rabbi was involved, uh, the board of deputies, the Jewish organization, uh, the Muslim council, Brandon Cox, um, charitable organizations, labor, and the Tories were involved in bringing that, getting me removed from Mail Online. And then you start to see the level of darkness. That's uh, a scary thing. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And when they come, when that network comes, and it's something I, I kind of say a lot is, is don't be fooled by like left and right or Jewish or Muslim or, or Catholic or any, any other religion, any religion you choose. And don't be fooled by this charity or that. When it comes to someone challenging power or questioning their power, they will work together like a, a swirling force of darkness and they will descend and they will crush you. Yeah. And that's what they did. Because I've created a platform now, we reach millions of viewers and downloads each month. We're becoming a voice for, not the voiceless, but for people just telling their story just from their side. Just telling their stuff. I've been offered big money to work for a certain radio, certain TV, and I've rejected everyone. I've seen my vision. But then, do I become a threat? Do I become a threat for people with like these people meeting up the stairs in the big dark clouds and we are managed to just fuck him off and cancel everything he's worked for that of course you become a threat because yes. I've spoke to enough people who have been cancelled yes. for having a voice yes and 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 you absolutely are a threat and will be being monitored that 100% that will be true when uh, when you become too much of a threat and there is a decision to eliminate you it might not be so let's just say I am on the coastline in southern Italy watching humans being ferried across from Africa. And let's just say that those individuals coming over are Muslims, let's say. So what will happen with this gathering force of darkness is they won't send maybe the Muslim council out to make a complaint or a signed letter from the head of the Muslim councils or all of the leaders of all of the mosques. They'll send actually instead the chief rabbi and the Board of Deputies. So they work in a cohort to leverage the complaints and they're going to do it to get Neil Oliver off uh, GB News. That'll be done within the week. And I think it's already happening, Board of Deputies. My point is, of course you're a threat and you will question how much you want to continue that, but it's so important what you're doing and our numbers are growing. And I bet you can feel the support is, is kind of surging towards you because people have a thirst for what you're doing. I think it's really important. And I think it's really brilliant of you, I, I mean this genuinely, that you didn't take one of the contracts you were offered because one of the really obvious mechanisms of control is to make you in-house somewhere where there are all sorts of control mechanisms that can be immediately placed on you contractually. Yeah. When did you realise that, though? <laughs> because the smoke and mirrors, you know, you're, the glitz and the glam, it's sexy as fuck. <laughs> right. Do you know what I mean? You can be brainwashed, and then if you are getting offered all this stuff, it's such a turn on, you don't want to lose it. Yeah. You don't yes. want, that's why I've got so much respect to everybody that gets cancelled, because I go, they've done something right. 
it, it's and it's and it's brutal. You know, people say cancel culture, and it's like, oh, I got cancelled off Twitter, and you're like, okay, um, but yeah. So let's, you know, I'm on. I'm I'm the Daily Mail columnist. I'm most read. Uh, you know, I'm I'm being read more than Piers Morgan, and he knows it. I can't help it. It's just, it's, <laughs> Get out and there, uh. I'm, just, I'm saying, I'm talking about the private, deeply satisfying things. Piers is on the phone to the editor to try and get his column put higher up on the page than mine because mine's being met. Like stuff I know about that was very, very satisfying that I never talked of. And then I'm on a boat in Cannes because it's the advertisers weekend and I'm the host of the panel. And there's all these famous people. I don't even know who they are. Jason Derulo, I got to like dance at his crotch, was very exciting. That was Daily Mail. And then when I started pushing, pushing to do, to be on the road, to be in the jungle at Calais, to be on the road in Southern Italy, to be really amongst the heart of the stuff I'm writing about, which is what I love. That is when... It all changed and all of this glitter and yachts and beating Piers Morgan just sort of collapsed away. And I just saw all of this control. And, and, and I know people speak of the matrix, but the matrix of control that actually permits what you can say and what you can't. And on a certain day, like a switch is flipped, it descends. And, and I think being completely, a cancel is too weak, being completely removed from life pushes you to a point and genuinely uh I considered just walking out of my house and and taking myself off to go swing because there comes a point where as a parent you believe the only way you can protect your kids is to off yourself because when your kids are being reported to social services that you're an abusive mother or you've got a couple of people coming to behead you in your home and it's being fitted with panic alarms, you, it's very clear that you are presenting a danger and a risk to your own kids. You become the magpie. I was the magpie in my own nest. I know you're a strong person. I know you've spoke out against many people, but when were you at your weakest through all that? It's come a few times. There's been times of really dark... Uh, uh, I guess when they took I have to be careful how I phrase it because I do own this it is my responsibility I am accountable so if I say when they took my house well they didn't just come and take my house did they I wrote a tweet about someone that was incorrect I deleted it I apologised for it I offered to meet I offered to do whatever was required to try and correct my wrongs in the way I spoke to you of but that wasn't enough and a new law was made that serious harm was done at the time of publication and that created a legal uh, I guess a new legal reference a new law that meant anybody if you perceived that I'd done you serious harm over the last five years you should come and sue me tomorrow that's how the law stands right now and it meant I lost my home. So it meant I had to go down a kind of bankruptcy process. Uh, and they took like some of my husband's stuff as well. I don't mean stuff, I mean money. Uh, so that was dark. And not the financial stuff, not, not money per se, just the home with my children's stuff. And they really liked that home because we all, it was a lot of fun. And um, that was bad. Uh, it the the um beheading attempt was was all right i i found the assassination of katie hopkins the play that the government funded part funded and the posters going up and my mother was particularly upset by those i found that difficult to explain because everybody thought it was a very you know high high-minded laughing matter and you just feel like oh you're so far from that and then i think when i got i was duped into accepting a trophy called the cunt award I can't tiptoe around the words I hate that word I never say it and it wasn't the humiliation of me and it wasn't just that I was tired and had been stupid and had been foolish uh, it was actually that um, I'd been tricked into going there because they said it was for white farmers and I'd spent three months in South Africa with white farmers I loved them and uh, and I'd been super kind. And the gentleman who was the white farmer who'd been attacked, allegedly, that's what got me there to get the trophy, well, to give a speech in support. 
uh, on the day, the boy that pulled the stunt said, oh, he's ill, so he can't come. And I'd offered to go and visit him in his bed and take him a whiskey. And that was a moment for me because it wasn't uh, the humiliation. It was that I genuinely believed I was being kind. And mm -hmm. ultimately, I know I am actually kind and pr pr quite, I'm quite a decent sort of person and that level of shame that was and using something I cared about that was probably another time I was happily to just get out the door I just wanted to go and lie under a sea I see you're a good person everything's energy you clearly got a great energy you are a good person you kind of lived that life where that's who you were at that start and saying things and a lot of the shit they say I, I believe I, I believe in what you say a lot of shit I think nah it's a bit much if I've had Andrew Tate on if I've had Tommy on I don't agree with everything they say I don't I talk pure shite sometimes this is why I've got the success I've got is because it's pure shite I talk sometimes <laughs> I, I say do you know what James I think I'm a genius then other times I think nah you're just psychotic <laughs> pulling the wheel over every fucking buddy's eyes like. yeah but it's good to flick between the two yeah. at least you have moments where you're like shit I think I'm actually really good at this yeah. but also you me Tate Tommy all of us boys um we never once asked, you'll never find a clip of you saying to people, I want you, I demand that you agree with everything I say. And that's always the bit I pick up with people when they say, oh, okay, I don't agree with everything you say, but, and I say, oh, remember, I never asked you to, because it is that, we never uh -huh. asked that, we just said our stuff and we were confident that we were all right to be not liked. Mm -hmm. uh, and, I, and I absolutely feel that way. And what's happened, funnily enough, is because the world went so mad and went kind of 180 on its head, I'm having this weird thing where instead of being the big, dark, malevolent, biggest bitch in Britain, I end up being this person that people are like, shit me, she isn't so bad after all, and she will just speak her line. And in at this age where everyone's hiding we need a kind of strong, we need strong voices, yours, yeah. Tate, Tommy. And, and I'm having this, I'm so lucky to be given this second chance to do my stand up or, or be online or, or have this amazing audience. And people are really marvellous. What do you think it's all about, Katie? Oh, yeah. it's coming. Yeah. What it's the coming. fuck is it all about? Like, because I always say this on podcast, there's no blueprint on manual how we should be living life. I always thought mm. a little fortune and fame. I'm nowhere near the level I'm going to get to. But I know how damaged it can be to the mindset mm. to try and just speak about life and other people's stories and let people... And the shit that you can get from that as well. Like I'm just a normal kid from Glasgow. It came from fucking nowhere to then be creating something special that it's only just blossoming. And yet the shit that you get, you think, why? What yeah. are you so angry at? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, um, so I, I am relentlessly and endlessly like optimistic and positive and like upbeat because I know this story ends well. So I don't know what time frame that's over. I certainly don't consider it to be in my time frame because I'm not, I'm not here for the long haul. Like I haven't got like a terminal uh, illness just yet, but I, old age never appealed. Like if I go out, I want to go out. She died standing up. So, so I'm not around so much longer, but I, I, I believe that the story ends brilliantly. I also believe that our paths are already set. So every time in this damn life, whenever I've thought, okay, I, I need to clear out of this and protect my kids, something, something has happened that just made me go, wait a minute, and something comes in your path. So I believe the more you are free and throw yourself to the path, the more your life opens up and you're surely is going to do exactly as you say. And then I also know that good does prevail. And I also know that never in modern history has there been a greater civilian militia than right now in America. Because every time Biden does something stupid, Americans go out and buy another weapon and they are preparing. And all over this fine country, one of the things I'm doing that I don't speak of, but I speak of here, is I'm building a network of speakeasies. And many of them have been built already without me. I'm not taking credit. And I go from town to town, groups of 100, 150, 250, meeting in above cafes, above underwear shops. People are gathering. Mm -hmm. And it is like the time of prohibition for drink. And now it's speech. 
And that to me is a vast army of people that are gathering purely because they need each other. And that's what my stand-up gigs are as well. We look around the room and go, holy dooly, we're loads and we're pretty fine. And, uh, and it, this is an exciting time. And we are, we are facing darkness. We're going to be pushed and squeezed. We're going to be forced out of our private vehicles. We're going to be forced out of our homes. We're going to have every freedom we ever knew in our lives taken. And that's coming right now. You see people speaking out left, right and centre now. They're just automatically getting shut down. As much as I love people to have free speech and that, but you've still got to be careful because they can just take your life just away. take it away. In a heartbeat. So you've got to kind of play it safe. I'm not daft. So well, that, that's the trick of the thing. Yeah. And that's exactly what, if we take the GB News example, they just got rid of Mark Stein because contractually they were trying to make him accountable for his own Ofcom fines, which can be £40,000. So he walked away. So now if you're the rest of the presenters, what do you do? Do you ally with Mark Stein and say, if you're getting rid of him, I'm off too? Or do you say, some platform is better than no platform? trying to keep some kind of platform even if we have to restrict and restrain ourselves is better than no platform right and that's the point yeah. you're talking to it's a game it's a it's game a, a game. frustrating would, game uh, would ever be at the forefront like you've done it you just says what you wanted yeah <clears throat> i do it in such a way where i still say it but i still i, I know how you're dark it's out there yeah and it's good what you're doing and i think it's smarter and and as my husband said on the day that i was fired from lbc one of the many many jobs i've been fired from if you know there's an open goal, right, you know, they're looking to kick the ball in the open goal, don't don't bloody shift out the way. Like, at least jump around like the goalie, which is sort of effectively what you're doing. You're ensuring you're standing in front of the goal so they can't just kick the bloody ball in the back of the net yeah. and get rid of you. How many times have you been fired? Oh, so many. I mean, so many. Any made-up excuses to get you fired? That was everything. <laughs> no, was, they're really legit. Like, I was never fired in my sensible phase of my life. Like, wasn't fired from the army. I just had to leave because of my crazy wiggly epilepsy that was vile. Uh, but I was fired from the UK Met Office, the weather people mostly because of fucking um, someone else's husband in a field and associated other terrible behaviours that came out during the it's apprentice. It's a legit one, to be fair. <laughs> <laughs> I was fired from... I wasn't fired from the sun. They, Murdoch was... Oh, Murdoch did once fire me from his helicopter, but his managing editor refused because they ran the column that was kind of held up at the UN General Assembly as being the worst thing that anyone had ever seen. Um, and I was interviewed under caution by the Met Police for that. Uh, I was fired from the Daily Mail, or I was let go, but that was pathetic. I was fired for, that was when the darkness descends, Muslim, Jewish. Um, I was fired from LBC, we did that. I was fired from, so I was just taken to Australia to do Celebrity Big Brother over there, and I was fired from that because I spoke out about the lockdowns whilst being in um, quarantine and then I got deported um, yeah half a million you were getting for the Australian <laughs> yeah. one and a bit more and was that? yeah and I was in country at a time when everybody else was locked down and you weren't allowed to go there and you weren't allowed to visit your own relatives and you weren't allowed to visit your father if he was dying and they brought me in and I gobbed off about that till till the cows came home and that really became problematic so and I, I guess that's my privilege and why I absolutely would ask that you continue to tiptoe the line in a bold way. You're not tiptoeing like a ballerina. I appreciate that. But you're standing your ground within the ground you have. It's because it's, it's good for me to be out doing what I do, facing, running towards the spears. Mm -hmm. And it's great for you to keep the platform because people need you. And we all have different roles to play. I think yours, you've already been running 100 mile an hour towards that. <laughs> I think I, I've been, got nothing left to lose. Uh, yeah, I think so it's you've all good. been there, done it. <laughs> I've just spoke to enough people to understand how this system works. And that's smart. Yeah. See, I, I consider that to be like an evolution, right? Mm -hmm. if, we're, mm -hmm. if we're free speech and we're like the monkeys standing up, you know, you're, you're the evolution of it that keeps the platform. And I have so much sympathy with that. But I guess my heart will always be with the kind of, you know, rugged yeah. forefathers that were like, mm -hmm. run towards the machine uh -huh. guns. And, um, and I love it. I, I love that I can't be stopped. You know, you weren't allowed into America without the vaccine. So I turn up in America and I stand on the stage and I say, lock me up. How did you get in? I got in via Mexico. What's that? So Mexico, 
Oh, Mexico. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah Did yeah, I say yeah. it funny? Did Mexico. I say it in a yeah, s- some southern softy? Yeah, thought... When you say what's that, I was like, wait, does James not know what Mexico <laughs> is? And then I was literally in my head thinking, how do I make it so he does without people <laughs> thinking he's silly? <laughs> I was like going to yeah, protect you like a mother. Mexico. Uh, just Me- how would you delayed. say Mexico? Mexico. It's just because you delayed it. I thought it was some new Mexico. vaccine or something. Okay, something was getting... no, I came in by Mexico. Yeah, yeah, that's is that, that how that's you that. say it? Yeah, great place. So, <laughs> <laughs> So, so, but it, the story goes back a bit because when California was brutally locked down, California was like, Australia's like, it's run by an absolute maniac that thinks he's going to be the next bloody president. And he may, may well be. And I went out there when it was proper locked down and I went in backyards, garden to garden, doing events, churches that would be open. Uh, I had a kind of name over there for doing Fox and I, I was kind of rallying the forces in California. So when America wouldn't let me in because I'm not vaccinated, the good people who I helped rally before came down in a van and they would pick me up from Mexico and I go across the border as an illegal and then I would stand on a stage. This happened three months ago. And I say, you know, I'm an illegal. Bring it. Uh, lock me up. And, and no one did. Who did you go with? Me. Yourself? Yeah, just always me. Do you feel as if that's what you, you're not bravest, but you're, yeah, best. you're happiest? Yeah. When you feel as if you're fucking the system? Yeah. How you, why is there such an American connection with you? Why do you love America? Because so, eventually, so I really, but you know, I really, really believe in what I do and what you do. Thank you. And I really, really believe in what ordinary people are doing. Then fame matters not and audience matters not. If you make it through another day and you kept your kids all right and maybe you managed to stay married or have a girlfriend or boyfriend or you did something that made you happy for a day, you've done bloody well, right? That's my belief. And... uh, so I really believe in this fight and I am so lucky now that I am completely free. I, so I, I don't own stuff. I don't, uh, my kids don't have my name anymore. Um, uh, my husband's isolated from me financially and I'm on extra time already. Like I had surgery, mm-hmm. massive surgery and uh, I'm already on borrowed years. So I've got this like massive lucky bag of stuff that I can just put on my back and that's the my favorite thing and the reason I love America so much is because I truly believe that one day it is America that we will call on not to save us but it will be like not all of America I'm certain Texas Florida Virginia maybe will become the sort of last bastion of the free world and from there we will come again so we're talking generations down the line do you think you're more accepted in America Oh, during the years that I was eviscerated here, I was able to uh, use my whatever talents I have. I was able to use them in America. But now, but no, I'll always be, this will always be, people that get me here really get me. And now that my audience has been kind enough to let me back in, this will always be home. But Americans have freedom hardwired into their souls and they can defend it with a second amendment how did you end up in a relationship with trump how was he retweeting your stuff in that how does the president of america start oh well i don't even know how you've got the gall to just sit there to look at me and my boobs and ask that question so i've kept looking that's all the reason i I want you here but like how can you even ask how did trump end up finding me Mm -hmm. like like really (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I think so I went on so it started with I went on a late show in Ireland it's run by a complete friggin dullard of a guy who's I swear to god I estimate his cock is no bigger (laughs) than that finger and I I have a feeling I'm correct and he's called Ryan Turbridy and I challenge Ryan to show his cock to you Mm. and if I'm wrong I will blow it I mean, it shouldn't take me long, should it? I'll follow him up. But that was a little bit of a back story there. I went on his show and there was outrage, outrage, because I'm going on a show and outrage. Whereas, in fact, every time we went on that show, I had the best time because it's a live audience and we'd have a riot on the show. And uh, we're talking about Trump. He's talking about my love of Trump. And I'm like, yeah, well, it's better to be grabbed by the pussy than have a pussy for president. And it 
kind of broke the studio and that clip got to Trump. And then behind the scenes at Mail Online, he was very supportive of what I was doing. And because of their PR people, his PR people, he slightly became enamored with what I would write. And then he would tweet me and then, but every time he tweeted me, I'd lose something. So like he tweeted me and they took my PayPal. He tweeted me again and they took my bank account and he tweeted me again. I was like, fuck, stop it, will you? Like they're going to take my clothes next. So, but it's been a joy actually. And, um, and that was a really fun time of life was being on Fox and having Trump in my, in my, as my wingman. It it's cool. funny, man, the shit that Trump gets, but he was only president never to start a war. There you go. And the only, only politician I know of who fought to build his country as opposed to manage its decline. How corrupt do you think that presidents and, pol- <gasps> and, and prime ministers are? Obviously, there's people behind them pulling the strings, but yeah. do you think, how dark is it? Is it, so, is it just a conspiracy theories thought, or is it a, no. a lot deeper than... I think it's the darkest it could be. I, I genuinely think it's dark. And and I, I still believe in Thatcher, you know, I still believe in, in her... I appreciate there's so many people who hate her, who were glad she was dead, all that, I get it. But I, I absolutely admired the, her tenacity at a time where women weren't in power at all and her ability to get shit done at a time when it was the unpopular decision and for her not to flinch from being hated. Those things were amazing things and we've never seen them again um, in a politician. But now, bought and paid for. I mean, Rishi Sunak, who even is, what, what even, I mean, who is invisible. Not even that, but he's short. Can't stand short people. Wear short trousers. <laughs> you know? short, is he? Oh, he's just minute. He's like five foot. So what am I? I'm five foot nine. He's like, he's, he's, he's literally tiny. I can't explain it to be like four foot. Like Sadiq mm. Khan height. Like the virtually waist height. It's disgusting. That shouldn't be allowed. And, you know, James, an important point is I blame women for short men. Because... No woman should be sleeping with a short man. <laughs> Get rid of them out. Fucking the press them out. Yeah. What do you think of all the equal rights shit now and all this femininity and masculinity? Oh, such bollocks, isn't it? Women really did the number on themselves. You know, they want all these rights, all these rights, all these rights. And it just made people friggin' unemployable. Like, you want to have a baby? Fine. That was sort of your choice. That wasn't the choice of the guy who's trying to earn enough wages to pay you, you silly moo. And the idea that someone's going to pay you to sit on your ass at home with the baby that you chose to have. Like, all of that shit I'm not into. Americans have six weeks unpaid maternity leave. I'm all about that. Mm. I'm all about proper, proper strong women that take, that accept that they've really stuffed up. Like if you're fat, that's no problem. But you ate yourself fat. Fine. <laughs> Maybe you've got a medical condition. <clears throat> you could still do something mm. about it. It's Nothing's a problem if you just own it. Like I own all of my bad crap. Like I own it. So I'm all right with it. Why did you get so much stick for the kind of fat shaming kind of, what was it, check in and weigh in at the same time at the airport? Like, why was it so... Weigh in and when you check in, well, that's just economic sense, isn't it? You know, the idea that I'm pay, I have to pay for my 30, whatever, luggage, 30 kilogram luggage, and yet some fat twat next to me who weighs 240, they don't have to pay. That's bullshit. But no, what really set their... <laughs> Uh, blackboard liquors off was it should be window liquors or blackboard scrapers shouldn't it but um, what set them off was me putting on so what am I eight and a half stone and I put on close to four stone in three months and then uh, lost it again in three months to prove that fat people are lazy that's what really tripped them sent them over the edge and fat me was bloody disgusting but the point I was trying to make was that we all have choices and you can choose to do something about stuff if you want to. Why do you think we live in a very soft generation now? Just, just this wanting to be liked. It, I think it boils down to parents wanting to be liked all the time, being mates. Um, you know, you hear them, don't you, in supermarkets. Hugo, don't do that, darling. Darling, don't do that. You know, my father, boosh. Um, not saying that was necessarily the right thing. Um, and teachers wanting to be friends and everybody wanting to be loved and no one willing just to make the tough decisions, call it straight, uh, say it, get the job done, you know, move on, which is a good military way of being. Mm-hmm. And we're going to need some of those skills again as we head towards what is coming. Do you think there'll be another war? I think there'll be, there's going to be a big 
There's going to be a big bloody fight at some point. And if yeah. it happens in America, I want to be there for it. But we cannot, we are going to allow 15 minute cities to happen. British people are going to allow their vehicles to be taken from them. A, an American could not physically process the idea that an energy company could break into your home to fit a prepayment meter while you're not there. An American cannot understand that concept because it could not happen in America. Because if you enter an American's home, you will be shot. I used to believe Britain was one of the strongest nations on the planet. It just seems to be becoming the weakest. Even in Scotland, fucking the guy raped two girls, put a, wig, put a wig on, went to court, and they're fucking trying to put him in a women's a women's say. jail. If you're if you're a trans, if you're a man, if you're born a man, you should not be going to a women's prison. You should not be competing in women's sports. You should not be competing in pageants like. Just fucking, if you want to make changes, be who you want to be. I always support that. I always state that because I feel as if people come for me, but I always state to be who you want to be. Do what you just want. Fucking leave it away from everybody else. Like, do what you want. Don't ask us to believe yeah, it. Yeah, and do just what don't try you and normalise that. Exactly. You go do you, leave us be. Yeah. So, but no, I, but I'm not down about it. You know, that's the point is more, more darkness is coming. So 15 minute cities, we'll see Oxford lockdown and South End and wherever else it's coming. We'll see more being taken away digital currency. We'll see restrictions on how much energy you're allowed to have or use. We'll see a credit system come in. But at some point, a good number of British people are going to stand up and I can feel it already. I feel as if people are going to stand up. It's I feel coming. as if it, but I feel as if, like you say, there's more darkness coming. It's ca oh, it's and, coming. And I didn't realise how silly people were and how fucking stupid people were. Yeah. Like, and, what, and what we need a lot of them to do, just like if I'm running, you know, if I'm running a section or I'm running a platoon, I need to point. I need to find my guys. So my section leaders would be my four or five key guys that I can rely on, and then I need to get them to handle the stupid ones. Right. And I don't mean that disrespectfully, like stupid as in you're thick. I just mean the ones who don't want a part in it, who aren't going to stand up or who are going to get in the way. So we need all of those people to just get out of the way. And those of us who are going to stand up are going to stand up and it's going to be strong and it's going to be mighty. And I'm, I'm really excited for it. Whatever guys it takes. Um, I think you just like fighting, Katie. I, oh, I, I absolutely love it. It feels as if you've been fighting the last 15 years I've, nonstop. For, before that. Longer. Before that, yeah, because um, I'm not at all uh, playing a victim card. I don't, I don't uh, ever talk really about my epilepsy. But uh, when I had seizures, those seizures got bigger and bigger and bigger till I was having them every single night, three or four a night, and they were big, bastard, violent things, and they would dislocate one or both my arms. I'd bite through my tongue or this lip, which is why it looks a bit funny, uh, and it broke my back once. My point is, every day I'd get up and think, right, when I've got my arms back in or whatever, I'm going to present as if I'm normal. And that continued. I'm probably the first epileptic to get through the Sandhurst, The Apprentice, Corporate Life. Uh, all that I've done until I got cured, I had this massive seizure thing going on secretly at night. So I think I've always had something to fight. Mm -hmm. I really like the fight. And now I'm really fortunate because the fight is really for a good thing, which is for ordinary people to live their life just as free as they can be. Yeah. You're clearly a fighter or else you wouldn't be at the level you were at and still doing what you're doing. Do you know what I mean? That, that takes courage and balls. One bit of pressure and people just fold like a fucking deck of yeah. cards now. When did it come on top of the head and you had to get the operation? Like, What was it? Because you nearly died, huh? Yeah, yeah. You felt it. You haven't felt it, have you? How squeamish are you? Uh, you have to feel it. Yeah, I guess that. So don't squidge, will you? Because it is actually my brain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So I'm fucking sick. No, 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 no. I felt that. Right, I, hold on, stay there. Right, can you feel this? Yeah. So it's brain calm. moving. Sorry. It's not that big, to be fair. <laughs> <laughs> it just confirms a lot of what people have been saying for years. <laughs> That's fucking minging. <laughs> Isn't it? <laughs> Isn't it? Are you talking about my vagina? Both. The <laughs> vagina's better, to be fair. I know you're nearly 50, but that's a better neck than the fucking head. That's flat, man. Isn't it? How big was that operation then? <laughs> so they got, it's basically the full Frankenstein. So they get a physical circular saw 
and they so the bit that's missing that you just felt for your audience is about that big like uh, of your of my of your skull. skull so they they circular saw that and then they 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 chop from here to here so it goes from ear to ear and then they open so they pull all this back which is obviously why i've got wrinkles but um so they open you like that so they can get in and then they got the bit that's like a tumory thing out threw it away i'm imagining that kind of gesture yeah. and then for a while they do this called a bone flap which is fairly disgusting and they put that back in uh, for, because they're supposed to, because it's your skull. But mine, I got meningitis and things were pretty uh, not great. So so they went back in, opened it all back up and then threw it away. So I live like this, like a little boiled egg and you can feel my brain move. And that's my best party trick that I have. But it cured me. Can you not get something to cover? Do they not get something to cover that? Or? I tell you what, they turned up in my hospital room with a fucking epileptic dickhead helmet mm -hmm. made of foam and I told them to <laughs> fuck my That'd be funny though. That? How good is that for your comedy show though? What? Yeah. <laughs> imagine me walking foam around head. with a freaking foam head. Uh -huh. I mean, no, no disrespect to any kid or parents who've got a child who wears one, right? If I'm laughing about this, I'm laughing at me. I'm not laughing at your kid. And if your kid's got epilepsy, you know, bloody, you have every sympathy of mine and anything I can do, email me and I'll bloody try and help. But there is hope. Uh, I'm laughing at myself. Yeah, of course. We've got to uh, laugh. Yeah, yeah. But I just want to be, you know, because I feel badly. Because it's serious, yeah, of course. Yeah, kind of. Um, so, yeah, that nearly killed me. But uh, I, they, they tell you before, they call it the deficit, which I, I love it when medical people, you know, use clever words so that, you know, they're not just fucking telling you straight, <laughs> which is what I prefer, right? I prefer yeah. to sit with you and you go, Katie, look, if this goes tits up, you could lose your left hand. And if this goes tits up, your left leg... Uh, worst case, you lose your speech and your sight. That's basically what it was. So, and I, I'd, I'd said to Mark, well, I'd, I'd, I'd rather not come back at all than lose those things. But I, um, turns out, I came back more or less normal. I mean, there's bits of me that aren't quite right. How? When did people find out you're going I for that operation? I can still feel my vagina. That's the main thing. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> you know what I mean? As long as you can feel the grass in your ass when you're shagging, <laughs> when you're shagging in a field, it's all good. It's worth it. Like, I have to like. It's a bit like a farmer's hand down there. Yeah. You could put, a, you could put a nail gun through get it. A, get the foam head down there. <laughs> See when you're going through that operation and all that. <laughs> Listen, I still make a real effort. Yeah, like, of course, man. You're when, a fighter. I, when I think it's the moment, yeah. I'm like, I pretend to squeeze it. you go it. for that operation? Did you get that hush-hush? <laughs> Didn't tell anyone. Because you could have died? Didn't tell my kids. <sighs> That's a brave thing to do, though. Why not? Ah, oh, set me off any day of the week. So I, uh, I told my mum and dad, and I, and obviously lovely Mark knew because he's taking me. And then I made a folder in my, which I still have, uh, for my kids with all the things in letters and where all their little bank things were and their savings and things I thought they should know that mattered. None of which probably mattered actually. And then I arranged with my mother, because they were coming to take over the house, because children, that we would, they would pull up and I would leave the house. Ooh. And mum and I would pass in the garden and we wouldn't speak to each other because this would happen. And so that's what we did. So mum came with dad, came in the door. We passed them, got in the car and went to London for the surgery. So yeah, I just didn't tell anyone. That's a brave man because... Is that your character though? What I've seen with this interview that is that you don't want anybody to feel sorry for you. Why? Um, or not, it's not even feel sorry for you, but it's like you fight the fight alone. You're probably your whole life. Like, it's, it's hard to explain, like, but I already see you're a good person. I know you're a kind person. I can see you're a soft cunt as well. Like, but... Shh. Don't tell anybody. Yeah, no, but I, I've interviewed enough people I know who's good and who's not. Everything's energy. You've got a great energy, and I know you're a good person. You can tell with the sensitive side as well when you've got that shield on and I'm this and I'm that. And I believe it, like, because even when you never want to play the victim, and I get it. Nobody does. Because, but why have you got that mentality where you don't want people to maybe not see vulnerability, but why have you always. You're not even protecting yourself. You're trying to protect the people around you, but while we're doing that, it's a lonely, it's a lonely case. It's a lonely journey. Mm. Why do you do it? Um, but because I genuinely 
want everybody um, to be all right. I genuinely want, genuinely want ordinary people to be super happy. I, I sound so naff and it sounds so like the woke people that I criticise. I gen The reason I signed up for the army is because I'm proud of uh, being British. I'm proud of what this country stood for and stands for. And I'm proud of ordinary people fighting hard to try their best. I bloody am. And anything I can take on that I think helps push that forward, I'm happy with. And I would never... It may well be easier for me to have time at home speaking about what was going to happen and how scared I was and how I didn't really have the courage to have the surgery and I was actually scared of not coming back. Well, no, I was scared of coming back, but without my leg or hand or sight. But it would be much worse for my children to be worried or upset. So it's always better for me to handle it alone. And the same with when I'm in danger or at risk on the road, like South Africa or at times, uh, different things I've done. It's better that I just handle that myself rather than cause worry to someone else. And I, I'm still all right with it, but you are right. There is a big, there is a big well of the pressure of that or the upset of that that I definitely carry and it's not that far away from me. Yeah. But it's also a good reminder and a good motivator. And, it, and it's useful when horrible things happen like you get given the cunt award and you're humiliated by eight million people sometimes this is helpful because at very worst i can remind myself that i know i'm not a bad person so even if eight million people are laughing at you you can go into yourself and know that you're not a bad person and that's actually kind of a powerful thing well you percent do you think a lot of the stuff that you said and done as well was a, a not a deflection but and acts say to them, protect yourself, that you weren't hurt and weren't broken. Mm. If people saw, and that's why actually over the last period of time, it's been very good because on my YouTube or Insta or whatever, people see a lot more of me and they get this me. And when people see this me, like on Celebrity Big Brother, because it was all the time, people go, oh, she's just this normal, ordinary, <clears throat> terrible woman who has terrible hair and a, a bad vagina and she's pretty funny half and a skull she's now. half a skull <laughs> bit manky <laughs> sweaty outfits occasionally growing <laughs> a beard but, and then but she also means all that shit and mm. they go oh well maybe i don't hate her maybe i kind of like the fact she stands for all that so it's been like a full circle we seem yeah. to have a lot more backing now but even when you were in the big brother house what six years ago what, what, I don't even know I was in like, Callum I was in Callum best I like love Callum him. he's such love a good Callum. yeah yeah such like, a good he when carries when you finish second as well like, it shows you that the people respected you and, and agreed with what a lot of the stuff you say well, yeah. what did you think how did you feel taking that because what I've realised over the years as well when people complimented you or people gave you you don't really accept it either so was that strange for you to be one of the most hated in Britain to then yeah, it was becoming the most, one of the <laughs> yeah. most favourite? Like, yeah, that bit was terrible. Yeah. So I went in as the most hated of all time and I only took a little bag because I was like, oh, I'll be out in a week. And I didn't want to go in because I didn't want to go in the house for all that time. Like in a house with nothing to do. Like it's a bit like sit in Brentwood for six months. So you have a fucking... <laughs> and then of course everybody has a price and they just kept on with the cash until I was like, okay. <laughs> so I went in there and actually, and you will understand this a bit, or a freelancer will understand this. For me, it was like, okay, well, I've I've got the money. I don't have to. I don't have to write columns. I don't have to create content. Sorry, I don't have to. You know, I had no pressure of a boss or work or people needing me. I can just like chill the f bomb out and be me and just hang out in my onesie and chill out with Callum, which is pretty much what I did. And I had a, and Michelle Visage and stuff, and I had a write off. So. Um, so that was kind of epic. But then, despite every single housemate voting me out every single time because I was an obvious choice and I probably pissed them off and they hoped that I'd be got rid of, every single time the damn British public would keep me in and it became ridiculous because I was voted out every single time inside the house. But outside, everyone kept me and that became emotionally mm -hmm. overwhelming to have support like that. Do you feel vulnerable when you're like, not now because I believe you accept it now and I believe you know now you're good. Uh, You've always believed you're a good person. I believe that anyway. I believe that. Do you know what I mean? But then did, was a vulnerability, did you see that as 
people could see through me then? I like so I like it in the moment. So like when I'm doing stand up now on stage, right? So there's a thousand people or whatever. In the moment where everyone's laughing and having a great time and I know what's coming next and I and I maybe I like the next next bit because it's written well and you know I love words and I love writing and and, and everyone's having a block. I love that's that's when I'm like that's me. This is me. I'm so happy with this. This is me. But the bit at the end when it finishes and everyone claps, I don't like that. That's re- that's like, okay, that's fine now. That's thank mm-hmm. you. That's lovely. I appreciate that you're here. So so it's that it's in the moment of the thing that I'm at my happiest. So it's why I think I'm at my happiest in the fight. Because mm-hmm. it's my home. Yeah. And I feel really good about it. What about Piers Morgan? What's your opinion on him? Just uh never been really that um worth all of the attention that he gets kind of unimpressive do you think he plays the game well though a brilliant brilliant strategic uh, he has a brilliant brilliant strategic understanding of the media landscape and how best to play it for maximum personal gain and that's all he is what about Andrew Tate I was one of the first to have Andrew on I know him personally and it's just sad to see that what can be done with you talking about this oh, it, cloud, I know what's brought him down I mean like, why do you think all the stuff is happening to him do you think he'd become too influential yeah I, I could list <clears throat> I could list right now uh, the the joining of dark forces that work together to bring him down and and by name and by organisation and I could even list the signed documents they will have produced to achieve what they achieved because I've seen them when they were used for me and I absolutely uh, respect the guy I love that my son loves a lot of what he says and I love that my daughter who'd never listened to any of what he said thought he's a misogynist (laughs) because that's so typical and I love that he stands for strength and I love that he stands for men being manly and I'm ashamed that he's been put away and I'm ashamed of people who run away from him or the people who've had him on their show, not you, had him on their show for the, eye. so this would be a Piers Morgan, for their clicks, for the eyeballs, because Piers wants some of what Tate's got. But when shit happens to Tate, they run away because they want to self-preserve. That really grips me. That's why I walked Tommy to prison. That's why I'm still mates with Belfield and have tried to be in prison, see him twice. You don't walk away. Yeah, that's how I've stayed my ground and I've supported the guy on all social media platforms Good. because, listen, if he's fucking guilty, he's guilty. I'll, I'll be the first to apologise. But right now I've got to stand my ground and I believe that he's not. I believe every time I've seen him around people, he's very well mannered, very well respected. And and you just sense that energy, man. Like, I'm very not... That's when it's just when you see people struggle. I seen a video him yesterday coming out of prison and he looked drained, man. He looks dreadful. He looked fucking he looked shocking. Shit. Those, yeah. those tracksuit bottoms are not helping anyone. Yeah. <laughs> I'll always say to anyone, whatever you're going to do, no matter how low your life gets, do not be in a tracksuit bottom. The tracksuit yeah. bottom never helps a gentleman, not in any regard, no mm-hmm. matter how fit you may or may not have been. So when he comes out, and obviously he'll be calling me, I imagine, what, first on the list, second? Mm-hmm. He'll be like, Kate, what do you think? And I'll be like, Tate, listen, the tracksuit bottom thing, stop that shit but uh, I really like the boy and I think he's been completely stitched up like a kipper you know I think he's done nothing wrong I think absolutely he became too powerful and so this same force of darkness the switch was flicked and boosh it descended uh, scary though isn't it totally you, you see a lot of that in yourself when you see people getting fucking ripped apart like that I see it and I see I see the staging of the media so, so you know how how much planning has gone into it because they have absolutely staged say in the initial removal from the house into the minivan leave the door open have the photographer here position him in the middle of the vehicle so that you can get a good shot of him position him here with the cameras ready so when he comes out he looks a bit bedraggled staging for the world's media to see the crushing of Tate okay. a scary man it's so scary that people don't realise how dark the, and they satanic don't. the world is sometimes. Even the Sam Smith stuff. I've seen his music video, man. I've been very outspoken about it. Be who you want to be. But he's pretending to blast the ass off a man while getting peed on in a music video. And kids can watch that. The reason why I'm so... is because I've got kids. I understand how much I try and protect them. I'm probably overprotective. 
do you know what I mean because I know how fucking dark this the world can be and especially the stuff I'm doing now that like, I'm so I, I wish I had the homeschool kids if I'm honest but we live and learn yeah. I know what do you think of the schooling what do you I think know. of the education system well two things one Sam Smith he looks like an undercooked <laughs> Greg sausage roll with nipple tassels on and anybody I don't care if you think you're trans or bi or queer or whatever if you're morbidly obese go and put some clothes on mate put some kit on that because that is beastly like proper dirty disgusting looking guy who is chronically now ill that's an ill okay that schooling uh i've really changed like i used to be like oh girls you must go to school and i got a private tutor which i paid for because my husband had left me and i had to make up the deficit so like i had to pay for a tutor and i was like you know like some maniac and now like my 14 year old the teachers were on strike and the kids were supposed to like log in online and I, we, max was like as if and i was like as if let's go and surf so we went off and i'm like bush if you can have a day out of school we're going to learn more than we're going to learn in school and we've got the same issues that lgbt blah, 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 blah. so um but max is really kind of uh solid he, he's he knows his own stuff he likes tape and he's got a job so i made it that all my only requirement of my kids was that they all got a job at 14. So he's got his job now down at the local garage. So um, I don't have a lot of time for school or the British school system. I would much prefer kids got to leave school at 14 if they wish to and just go and hook up with tradespeople. I know that some of the travellers, in fact, one of the travellers are a billionaire, Alfie Bessler. Like he left school at 11. Come on. You, billionaire? You know, and it, but, you know, if you're really into school, you love it mm -hmm. and you want to go and study you know, community matters and LGBT and all that. Bloody do it. Like, mm. you go do that. But for <clears> the normal rest of the kids who want an adventure first, get out there, you know, and I'm really happy that my kids are out of that now. Apart what, from about, one. what about Kanye West? I know a lot of the stuff he sounds you think is crazy, man, but there's a lot of stuff that makes sense. That What do you think? What's your opinion on him? I think he just got a like, bit yeah, lost. I think he, yeah, just got a bit lost and Yeah, bold. I think so, I think he? what he needed was a really, like, smart, hot woman like me, in mm -hmm. his life I'd look great in some Yeezys and um, he needed a bit of like I think he needed a hobby honestly I think he just got pissing bored and so he just started doing all sorts of shit randomly and now he's lost everything like he's more broke than broke yeah it's a shame isn't it he's got see, nothing like, left what a talent he was as well right but do you see a lot of that the, the the media breaking people down do you think if, again if that was somebody else went through even a fucking 10 for you and through the bit of side though yeah yeah it push, you know what I, I mean, mean and like I, push and him I, over the edge yeah. and you can understand that like, oh, do you it. see a lot of people Lots. in this environment just <sighs> broken down and, and I see how close they go to the edge as well and all sorts of people over the year 15 years or so I've always made sure that when it, when the doesn't matter really what side they come from, even of any argument. When I see that machine go for them, I'll always get in there and just say, look, you know, if you, if you need a chat, if I could just say a couple of things and tell them a couple of things that help me. And, uh, and that's been a variety of people. Um, so most recently, I guess, Andrew Bridgen, I know he does a, a line as if he's fine, but that's not been so good for him. There was a time, uh, the guy that runs the free speech union, Toby, you know, many, many people that don't speak of it have been pushed to the very edge, the very, I call it sort of the high wire, you know, between life and death, where you're, you're walking a fine line because you don't know if it's worth it anymore. And you've been pushed there by surround sound darkness. And you honestly believe the only way to stop the noise is to, is to as I would explain it, get underwater. And that's why drowning, I so understand drowning because it, it feels very silent and quiet. And so I'll always get either to people's agents or get to them and just say, because I think so many people see me as the last person on earth that would ever want to help someone. But, um, you know, it turns out the opposite is true. And we'll know that the pressures that have been put on us or Tate or whomever, there are ways to try and get through. And in, in the initial phases, it's just holding on and breathing, like literally Mm -hmm. your only job is to try and get to tomorrow oh, yeah. and that 100% is how, how I get some people through some of this because Tate talks about the Matrix to cancel them first they'll put them in prison second and then they'll kill them yeah. like, how dark is whether it's a Matrix or the men in black like, do people give you a warning look you either rein it in sign this contract and give you a bit more money but 
follow this agenda or it just, it just keeps coming happens. keeps coming yes. once, they're, once they're out for you they're out for you yeah and then it and it but but it, it um if i describe it best as one of those like if you imagine a massive i don't know prep not a pressure cooker but something big and robust so first of all so they eviscerate you from your job so you know everything you you were working for and then you know so then it's social services on the call but they always call on friday evening at seven o'clock to tell you that your kids have been reported, they're going to be need to be interviewed. There's been reports of abuse, and then mm, uh, the call comes always in the evening from the police. Or oh, there's been a there's been a report of blah, blah, blah. we need you to come in for informal questioning, and then and then in Australia two in the morning we might have to take you to immigration detention, and then they shut off your water and and they just keep just keep hoping they'll tip you and with litigation you know the legal letters uh, with the costs and it just they just pile it up till there's no you there's no air for you to breathe anymore I can feel that old I can feel that pressure and I know, know it's on tape and and the, the lovely thing that we can do is get in under it and just lift it up a little bit so someone can just breathe a little bit you know until they can breathe a bit more team you were going through that did you feel as if nobody cared yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, Did you, anybody ever come forward for you and say, "Listen, I've got you." There's, there's always. So this is sort of my to my earlier point about your path is already set. There's always been one person, like lovely Mark, has been is a constant in my life. Like he's an unbelievable guy, and and uh, he's quiet and calm and patient, and and is called lovely Mark by other people, but there's always been someone that just presented themselves at that moment that just lifted up the concrete. And it's been the weirdest thing. And it's happened every single time. And, uh, and it's why I guess I try and be that person a little bit for somebody else now when I see um, them having it done to them. And, uh, but it is absolutely crushing. It is absolutely designed and coordinated to get you to swing. Yeah. How did your relationship with Tommy Robinson start? Oh, I was always an admirer. I always had liked, because, you know, we because we all have these different roles to play, you have this role where it's really important. You keep this ground that you've got, you know, this is your, I don't mean other people can't come on it. I mean, you don't let them take it from you. You keep this turf. You stay in front of the goal. And Tommy was operating in another field, you know, on the streets, the Luton lad, the I won't be crushed either, that, you know, and I, I so loved that. And he just was relentless in the fight to speak the truth and stand outside the court. And even when we knew he'd go down and do time inside, even though no one had ever done time inside for contempt before, that day when we walked in, this is where ordinary people just come into their own, walking him to prison, court, but prison, the wall of noise that day, it still makes my, ugh, makes all of the hair on all of my body stand on end, or not that there's that much hair on my body, just so you don't get the wrong image. Um, but it was, you know, it was Tommy, Tommy, Tommy Robinson. And it was like, there was something really euphoric about ordinary people going, we're, we're still with you. Um, but yeah, I, I, Tommy, can, Tommy sometimes criticises, I know, because he feels that he gets left uh, to fall by some of his own side, me included. Um, and I understand that as well. Mm -hmm. He would like me to have all of his content on my channel all the time. And I, I totally get that. What about religion? Like I see religion is to divide the world. I, I was raised a Catholic. I've got a big fucking Jesus crucifix tattooed on my back. Like, Have you? Yeah. I'll show you later. That's quite hot. It's, yeah. It's, uh, I was going through that stage of my life. At that stage, it served me at that time. I thought, but now I just see religion is to divide the world. I know people follow, follow religion. They're great people. Some people follow it. They're bad people. Yeah. Like anything in life. But what's your opinion on religion? I've probably chilled out about it a bit because I used to be like, it's the big problem. And I, and actually, when I, we talk about the, the gathering of the, the, the matrix or the darkness, heads of the absolutely, absolutely the darkness sits with the heads of the Catholic Church the heads, the chief rabbi, heads of religion are absolutely part of the controlling matrix, 100%. But 
at an ordinary person level, I quite love that people have belief in something. And I believe, because of my belief, which is that your path is set, that's sort of religious. And for other people, their belief gets them through. And I think we need to believe in something more than just ourselves or our everyday or our work or our mm -hmm. kids or our dog. You know? Yeah, so I believe in a higher power. Yeah. You've got to believe in something. You I really do. fucking died. Like, I believe I did, in I didn't a higher power. Go. I believe in like, I've went through, um, I used to have an addiction, so I went through NA, GA, gambling, fucking lots, and people turn to Christ and it changes a life, and then they yes. help people who are done homeless work. Yes. There's people preach this, the Bible yes. and stuff, and it's saving people's lives, so be it, but there's so much bad in the Bible, there's so much bad in the Quran, so much goodness in it as well. I've got Muslim friends, I've got Christians, they're amazing people. As long as they're not harming anyone, I'm so be it. But for me, there's a higher power that I question, maybe a dark, I'm not even a dark question, but it's a deep question. Like, why do you think humans are here? What's, what's your opinion on it all? Because I question that. Like, what the fuck am I here for? Yeah, <laughs> right. What's the purpose? What, what's the, who, who <laughs> what's made, the point? Who made us? Like, how that brain, the central nervous system, the spine, the liver, the kidneys, the heart. So who, who's created that? Some genius to put all that together. Because I think I'll be in a game is it are we avatars are we are we aliens is this just some metaverse fucking because time goes that fast i just turned 39 last week i know your birthday is the 13th of february mine is the second Aqu aquarius you stop yeah so um it's just a, yes, what do you think a big like, why are we yeah, here thing. do you have a question that yeah, all the time. And so I have this big relationship with the sunshine. I kind of use that as an excuse to get to the sun wherever I can and to spend more time in, hold on, Me Mexico. 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 So saying it your way so uh, we don't have any confusion. But uh, I like when I see the sun in the morning when I'm out running, right, I'll stand and I will stare at the sun because I'm like, mm, put the sun in me and it will power me through the day like some rechargeable cell but I believe our purpose here is to like carry the torch right and so every day we're carrying the torch like not literally a torch but we're carrying this baton and our very best effort is to try and make other people's day kind of all right or a bit better and to carry this kind of faithfully as we can like how we got past it so that we can pass it on so that's like parenting or having kids or if you don't have kids you're still trying to like do your best effort so that when you pass it along or you pop off you left it pretty much all right that to me is what our job is so it's not like got a massive meaning but then when you look at the darkness that's coming when you look at how oppressed we're about to be when you look at how freedom is about to be crushed out of us it does make more sense that you're going to take on this freedom torch and what we're going to pass it over with what 15 minute cities not being allowed to fly you have to be vaccinated digital currency piss off because that is not what we talk the torch on as mm -hmm. so that's my reckoning with it but i like i like that people believe i do and i love that americans still say one nation under god and americans believe your freedoms are given to you by god and that might sound religious and kooky but what it means is no man can take them away and that is in that is instilled in them mm -hmm. and if only more of us understood that no man can take them away no nipple height rishi sunak can say net zero is the ambition no it's not piss off do you know what i mean yeah. see when you're back in the day when you're your controversy and bringing all the views how how much do you look back and then feel used because i watched andrew tate there and how much because Piers Morgan needed Andrew to for his show I oh. believe to bring views and that's how really, 100% you've got that's to, why I'm pissed though yeah, because then, then he runs clever, away yeah. he, and, he, if there's this and that's getting attention that's Piers if there's this and that's getting attention that's mm -hmm. Piers he'll just move to he'll he's just an attention vulture but that's what you were as well because you were on Celebrity Juice you were on everything and on anything that do you look back and think they fuckers use me but you're still promoting your own no. brand as well yeah, but no do you know what I, mean? I was happy with it anything yeah. i said i'd do i was happy with anything i didn't want to do celebrity big brother i didn't do until the point they paid me so much that i felt morally obligated because my husband was looking at me like yeah they're going to pay you this much to sit on your ass in a house mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so so i feel absolutely not used by anybody in that regard yeah that's a good thing i was naive about some things mm -hmm. like going on the apprentice i thought i'd come out looking all right but I, I that's my naivety i still chose to engage with all of this and mm -hmm. i did i don't feel used by anybody see when you go out cancelled then you get the, op was the operation come after being cancelled no before that so see when you're going through all that as well that 
What are you then thinking about your life? Are you just thinking, what next? Or did well, you have I got plans? Removed. Yeah. Well, for a while, well, for a while, I was doing the okay. What I have to do today is breathe in and out, not not top, you know, not yeah. end yourself. Because that's years and years of hard work as well. Yeah, yeah, Putting yeah. yourself at the forefront, totally taking all that abuse, taking the death threats. Like, well, and also learning, learning yeah. to write columns well, learning to write columns people would read, learning to write columns that my boss would approve of. My boss was not working for Mail Online. It's not, you know, most men don't last too long there because it's brutal. If mm -hmm. someone doesn't like what they've done, they will pick up a phone and shout your friggin' nuts off until you do what they want. It, it's a brutal industry. Same with radio. If you don't perform, you're gone. Um, so... So I was, I got myself good at that career to have it all taken. Yeah, that. Um, but it just over time, you know, just I guess this refusal to stay down, that thing that we have in us, uh, that enjoyment feeling most myself when I'm in the fight or on a stage or people are with me and they're having a good time or, or feeling better. That just is in me. I can't stop it. And so I set out and I spent three months on the road in America just bringing audiences together where I could work. And eventually now Britain has sort of caught back up with me and, and I'm very lucky that I have a, the opportunity possibly of, of a stage again. Do you feel as if this is a, a fresh chapter? A new oh, this improved, is. Katie? I wouldn't say new improved me. I'm very lucky to be super well, really mm. am. I'm super, I'm beyond lucky to have like the people that support me that do just all that turn up at events and stuff it's awesome and i am uh i'm really really happy to be alive now like i think sometimes we have the worst of times coming but this was one of the best of times to be alive so i'm really chuffed and uh if my life did end as I leave here, I mean, ideally not Stop falling down the stairs. Bastard, no, not sake. at all. But if your life ended tomorrow and you're all right with it, I don't think that's depressing at all. I think it's awesome. You speak about death quite a lot, though. Yeah, because I am definitely. Maybe I had to reconcile with it a while back. So I'm so. It is real. British people need to reconcile with death earlier in life because it allows you to live your life completely free. Of course, as soon as you're born, you start to die. That should be the only motivation you need to get up in the morning. Well, you just, that's die. more freaking depressing than anything <laughs> I ever bloody well said. I'm a depressing bastard. I, 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 I that, do motivation that, with quotes and really... That I just is feel really like depressing. No, okay. not at all. It's just if we reconcile... So, we wouldn't have had the need for vaccines and lockdown if people weren't terrified of the idea of death. This idea that you could run and hide from death is what allowed the government to control people. Mm -hmm. If you lose that fear, you're uncontrollable. And that's perfect. How did you get into comedy? The stand-up side because of Because, A, clearly... You're a funny bastard anyway. I used to watch your videos and think... <laughs> it's because it was your deliverance of saying something. But because that, you used to push people's buttons. You actually okay. remind me and my mum. Like, she used to push the buttons that say so calm. Yes. And it, you, she, you can, now you can feel the rage in people. <laughs> Do you feel as if, okay, I've won? Yeah. Do you feel I've won? Yeah. They've gone. As soon as you give that energy, that you're gone. You've, yeah. won, you've won whatever it is you're talking about. Yeah. Because you've done it so calm and collective... <laughs> uh, people just do because I watched a few of your interviews <laughs> on the chain coming down I thought you fucking bastard but I you am. just because you'll say things so <laughs> not even annoying but just so sharp and it's it's done really calmly and yeah. really dry but also as if as if I as if I'm your friend and yet I just patronising you you're a fat and yeah. you're absolutely shit at what you do <laughs> and, and then you just slight pause with middle distance yeah. and then you've, you've fucked them yeah. so yeah I, I know I can I know always thought I was funny my husband's like you know I can funny and then I've been learning how to try and deliver more funny and, it, and it's working out alright and because life's so bloody ridiculous it's pretty easy to be funny mm -hmm. right Yeah. you've got dickheads running around with masks on their own in a car it's pretty easy to be funny so you see a change now you're becoming not a different character but you've seen more love coming the yeah, way yeah. that's what it is all about it's cheesy yeah. as that it's good to feel important it's good to feel love that yes. is man and we can hate and we can say shit to cause a bit of controversy but the bottom line is when we go home at night we just want our kids to be happy our man yeah. wife and, and just to love us yeah yeah and, and my life is full of that everywhere I go 
people will chat to me because they either think they know me or do know me or know my face or think I work at the hospital. So they chat. Mm -hmm. And everywhere I go, I have a bit of a laugh with people. And I'm getting to do this amazing thing of being on the road doing stand up with brilliant audiences that I love. Stay behind till the last man standing afterwards. I hug every single person that comes that wants to. Not, I don't force myself on That's an extra 10 quid you get a blowjob. It's a very exciting. And that's just me. Uh, no, and um, yeah, I, I have definitely lived this life and I've definitely been through it, but I'm definitely uh, on the easy bit now. I'm on a, a really can, good thing. Where, where can people get your tickets, Katie? Where, where can well, their website? You. Yeah, Mark built it. So it's Katie's Arms because, because I have... Um, arm muscles people have made the thing about my arms so it's like a pub katie's arms katie k-a-t-i-e-s arms a-r-m-s katie's arms.com mm -hmm. and where's the, the tour the uk tour <laughs> well there were 30 venues we're down to like eight because of weirdos trying to cancel everything and we're sold out in um bristol and bournemouth and stamford but there's still tickets in stafford Perfleet. we're coming to scotland in october blackburn there's mm. a few tickets left so so please please do go and I say this not for myself and I say this not because um, I want to sell tickets I say it because I want people in the room because if you look around the room 13th of May in Blackpool a thousand people with you who just want the very best for you and want you to be okay and to think whatever you want and they'll buy you a drink probably half time that is that's that's all, yeah. all I'm about right now. And you've still got your YouTube, you've still got your Instagram. YouTube's still there, Instagram's still there. Um, and What's happening with Twitter? Because everybody's back on that. Yeah, I can't be. I'm, I'm banned at a different level. Are you? Yeah, so it's Metropolitan Police and Europol. So they, they do some sort of terrorist level bans. I'm that. <laughs> What's your biggest regret, Katie? And, uh, and, and I'm on TikTok, but I'm not on TikTok. It's just some sweet, sweet person who takes all my content Aww. and puts it over there, which I love. TikTok's massive. Well, good. Thank you to the person who's doing that for me. Yeah. I'm grateful. Um, my biggest regret. Oh, shit me. Um, shit. I don't know, because uh, everybody has something. I suppose... That... Oh... It's so hard to say. I don't regret really freaking anything. I certainly don't regret anything I've said. I think I could have been a bit nicer to lovely Mark sometimes. <laughs> no, I honestly, I don't know. I don't know. When are you at your happiest? Um, oh, with, out running with my dogs at six in the morning when it's just getting light and then the sun comes up or sat in the blazing sunshine or drinking wine. Yeah, I just, I'm just... You know, in my little in my little scruffs, running around my garden with the dogs. Mm -hmm. Perfect, little quiet, sitting on my own in the sunshine, eating steak and chips when I'm tired. Perfect. <laughs> that that. I would choose steak and chips in the sun on my own with wine over sex. I totally, <laughs> I totally would. Unless it's on a field. <laughs> yeah, for unless any, they're hot. Yeah, for anybody, I know you've battled with mental health. I know you struggle a wee bit of depression, especially everything you've, you've went through. For anybody that's watching struggling, Katie, what advice would you have for them? There's times where you don't even have to acknowledge that you're really, really, really on the edge of things. You can just accept that all, your only job, your only job is to breathe in and out, like get everything, write it all down or, or, or draw a picture of it and push it away from you. Your only job is to breathe in and out and then hold on to just anything because it will pass. And it might not be tomorrow that you feel better or the day after, but it will pass. This too shall pass. Just hold on and imagine people like me around the back of you with a rope and all you have to do is hold on. That's the immediate action that you have to take. Uh, and it's really important because it saved me more times than I know. Good things will come. Yeah, proud of you. First of all, everything you've came through and still fighting that like, takes massive courage. Proud of you. New career doing the stand up. Like, again, massive courage to do it. <laughs> Anybody I know that does comedy has <laughs> fucked in the head. Though, like, I tried it as well back in the day, believe it or not. I'm a funny bastard. But every comedian I know are fucking nuts. There we are. They're all nuts. nuts. Yeah. And I thought, I was trying to change my life at that time. <laughs> and I thought, <laughs> they are this psychic. is going to make me worse. <laughs> but, Katie, listen. Absolutely love your story. Aww. Amazing what you're doing. Fucking proud of you for keep going. Would you like to finish up on anything? 
Oh, bless you. Well, I, I'm not to be maternal in any way because I don't want to give my age, but I think um, what you're doing really, really matters. I think defending your turf and keeping your platform really, really matters. And I think your supporters, uh, my request to them politely would be if they could just let one person know what you're trying to do, because the, it is very noisy out there. There's lots of voices all the time, but the more we consolidate behind certain certain sorts of people, uh, the better. So if everyone can just let one person know to follow you, that would be really brilliant. And always know um, that if the shit ever does hit the fan and you do have to do the lonely walk uh, to prison or whatever, I will be right there at your side. Um, so keep doing what you do because it does really matter. Appreciate that, Katie. Listen, all the best for the future. Look forward to watching the rest of your journey. Thank you. Thank you.